Hi everyone, my name is Shankar Nath and welcome to video 2 of ET Money's Debt Mutual Fund series. In the first video, we focused on the building blocks. What is a bond, how are bonds priced, the different types of debt mutual funds, and more importantly, how to look at these funds on the basis of their investment objective, investing strategy, credit risk, interest rate risk, and some other important variables. In the second video of this series, we shall center our attention on the fact sheet. Over the next 20 odd minutes, we learn the meaning of terms like yield to maturity, modified duration, average maturity, etc. with examples, and how you can apply these learnings in improving your investing process. And if there are any particular parts of the video that you really like, do let us know in the comments box below as it will help us create more follow-up content across our blogs and other social media channels. Or ha, agar aap is video ko Hindi mein samajhna prefer karte hain, to CC button daba ke Hindi subtitles ko zaroor on kare. Let's get started. The fact sheet should ideally be the starting point before you invest in any debt mutual fund. All ET Money users, and hopefully you are one, can access the contents of the fact sheet in the scheme detail page of every fund. The fact sheet is generally a summary but provides a wealth of information, and if used properly, it does help improve the investor's returns while reducing the portfolio risk. Now let's understand the different parts of a debt fund fact sheet with an example. So we have one here for the ICICI Prudential Banking and PSU Debt Fund. Most fact sheets can be divided into six main sections. The performance section, the fund details, the quantitative indicators, the portfolio, the style box, and the riskometer. Now most investors are already using the fund performance, fund details, and the style box in their fund selection criteria, so we won't address these in this video. Instead, we'll focus on the three ignored sections, which are the quantitative indicators, the portfolio, and the riskometer. With that being said, let's start with the first of the four quantitative indicators, which is the yield to maturity. Debt mutual funds do not offer a fixed rate of return like bank deposits. Instead, debt funds offer an indicative return called the yield to maturity. A bond's yield to maturity is the total rate of return an investor expects to earn if he or she holds the bond until its maturity. Let's understand this with an example. So we have a bond whose face value is 1000 rupees and offers an annual coupon rate of 6%. The bond itself has 10 more years to mature and is currently available at a discount. So let's say the bond is priced at 900 rupees. Now we apply the YTM formula. So the annual interest is 60 rupees, the face value is 1000 rupees, the current price of the bond is 900 rupees, and there are 10 years still left for maturity. This gives us a YTM of 7.4%. Now this 7.4% is the YTM for a single bond. But debt mutual funds invest in many bonds and thus the portfolio yield will be the weighted average yield of all such bonds held by the fund. Now one point I said earlier was that the YTM is merely an indicator of portfolio returns. In fact, there is every possibility that the YTM and the actual returns would never match in an open-ended debt fund. Let's understand this by extending our previous example to another scenario. In this instance, we assume that two years have passed and in that period, the company which issued the bond has gone through some difficult market conditions. And as a result, the bond has had a ratings downgrade which has resulted in a sharp fall in its price and is now trading at 600 rupees. In this case, when we apply our YTM formula, one finds that the new YTM will be much higher at 13.8%. So a bond which was at a YTM of 7.4% two years back is now at a YTM of 13.8%. This means the YTM is constantly changing with changes in rating, with interest rate changes, inflation, and many other variables. And that's probably why we believe that the YTM may not be the best or maybe not the only indicator that one should use to determine debt fund returns. Another related point is that an abnormally high YTM like the 13.8% we saw in our example can be indicative of investments in low quality debt instruments. So while the potential to earn is higher in such a case, it might be due to an increase in the portfolio's credit and liquidity risk, which is something all debt investors should be alert to. And speaking about alertness, if you haven't done this yet, then do subscribe to the ET Money YouTube channel to access more such videos and do tap on the notification bell so that you can receive alerts every time we upload a new video on the channel. 
Maturity is defined as the time period at the end of which the principal amount is returned to the bondholder. Now debt funds invest in many instruments, each of which carry a different maturity. This then requires the debt fund to calculate the portfolio's average maturity. Let's take a quick example here. Say a debt fund is invested in three bonds with a face value of 1000 rupees, 3000 rupees and 5000 rupees each. Now these three bonds are maturing in three, four and five years from now. A quick weighted average would give us the average maturity of the debt fund, which in this case comes to 4.4 years. Now the real question is, what does average maturity tell us and how to use it when evaluating debt funds? Very simply, the average maturity is a measure of the fund's sensitivity to interest rate changes. And as a thumb rule, higher the fund's average maturity, higher is the interest rate sensitivity. In fact, here's a quick reckoner of the average maturities across different category benchmarks. Do notice that the liquid, ultra short term and low duration funds have a low average maturity and therefore are not much affected by interest rate changes. However, long duration and gilt funds have a much higher average maturity and consequently have higher interest rate sensitivity. Now, a common misapprehension here is that a higher interest rate sensitivity is not a good thing. However, if you recall from video one of this series, you'll find that having a high interest rate sensitivity when the interest rates are on its way down can be a very profitable period for funds which carry long-term papers and play the duration strategy. Another related point here is that it is not uncommon to find different schemes within the same category having starkly different average maturities. Like in the case of dynamic bond funds where there are some schemes which have an average maturity of just three to four years while other schemes in the same category go as high as 10 years. This variability in average maturity across schemes is mostly attributable to how fund managers view the direction and timing of interest rate changes. So if the fund manager believes or for that matter if you believe that interest rates are going to fall then you would want to stack your portfolio with more long duration papers. Net-net from an investor's perspective, an understanding of average maturity is very important as it has a bearing on your investment horizon and the active management of your debt portfolio. The Macaulay duration is a measure of how long it will take for the price of bond to be repaid from the internal cash flows of the bond. Let's start with a very crude example. Say you have invested in a thousand rupee bond which matures in 15 years and pays a coupon of 8%. That's an interest of 80 rupees every year, which means you would have recovered your invested amount of 1000 rupees in 12.5 years, which is much before the 15 year maturity of the bond. Now let's make this example more real. So we have the 1000 rupee bond at an 8% annual coupon and a maturity of 15 years. Further, let's say the prevailing RBI interest rate is 10%. In this case, here's how the Macaulay duration is calculated. First, we map out the yearly cash flows, which will be 80 rupees for each of the 15 years and the 1000 rupee principal in the 15th year. Second, we find the present value of each cash flow by discounting it by the 10% interest rate. Third, we apply the time weights to the present value such that the year one cash flow of 72.7 is multiplied by one, then 66.1 in year two is multiplied by two and so on. And finally, we total the time weighted cash flow present values and divided by the non weighted present values to get the Macaulay duration, which in this case comes to 8.7 years. Now, of course, you don't have to calculate the Macaulay duration yourself and the mutual fund fact sheet will give you that number. What you really need to know is that a bond with a higher Macaulay duration will be more sensitive to changes in interest rate. And we'll understand a bit more of this when we study modified duration. The modified duration measures the bond's price sensitivity relative to a change in its yield to maturity or the interest rates. Okay, this might sound a little complicated, but very simply, if the modified duration of a bond is say five years and the interest rate goes down by 1%, then the bond's price will increase by 5%. Notice that when the interest rate goes down, the bond prices go up and that happens because of the inverse relationship between interest rates and bonds. Similarly, if the interest rate had gone up by 1%, then the price of the bond would have gone down by 5%. Now, the reason why we covered the Macaulay duration before the modified duration is because the formula for calculating the modified duration is derived from the Macaulay duration itself. In fact, let's apply the formula on the previous example. The Macaulay duration in that case was 8.7 years. The YTM is 10% 
and the frequency of receiving the coupon is 1, that is once per year. Which means the modified duration is 8.7 divided by 1 plus 10% divided by 1, which comes to 7.9 years. And how do we interpret this 7.9? Since the modified duration illustrates the effect of a 1% change in interest rates on the price of the bond, therefore if the interest rate increases by 1%, the price of this bond will decrease by 7.9%. And if the interest rate decreases by 1%, then the price of the same bond will increase by 7.9%. Okay, now that we have learned this, let's see how we can put this data to use. For one, the modified duration analysis indicates the fund manager's view on the movement of interest rates. So if a debt fund is having a lower modified duration, then it's probable that the fund manager expects the interest rates to increase. This will be a reason for him or her to opt for short duration papers to soften the impact of a price fall. But if the fund manager expects a drop in interest rates, then he or she is likely to keep the modified duration high. Another application of modified duration is your own selection of debt funds. So say you want to minimize interest rate risks. In that case, it makes perfect sense to select funds with a low modified duration. By low, I mean one year, maybe 1.5 years, but definitely within two years. In fact, investors with a low risk appetite should stick with debt funds which have a low modified duration. But if you have a moderate or a lot more risk appetite, then you can opt for a higher modified duration. But remember, one should never decide on the basis of an isolated variable. You have to start evaluating on the basis of the YTM, the RBI interest rate cycle, the fund's credit risk, performance, expense ratio, and a few more variables and then decide on which funds one should invest in. Actually, let's look at a very interesting example on how you can project your next one year's return by using some of the variables we have discussed here. Let's say you select a fund with a modified duration of six years, which has a YTM of 8%. The expense ratio of this fund is 1% and there is an expectation that interest rates will go down by half a percent during the year. In that case, your expected returns would be the YTM plus the interest rate changes multiplied by the modified duration minus the expense ratio. This comes to 8% plus half a percent multiplied by 6, which comes to 3%. So 8% plus 3%, that's 11%, minus the 1% expense ratio, which all totals up to 10%. So the expected returns for the year from this fund is 10%, assuming your expectation of a 0.5% drop in interest rate fructifies. Now, instead of the RBI reducing the interest rates by 0.5%, say it increases the interest rate by 0.5%. In this case, the expected returns would be 8% minus 3% minus 1% expense ratio, which comes to 4%. Of course, this interest rate ulta pulta may happen or may not happen, but the idea here was to explain how you can practically use what we have learned in this video so far. For more insights on these quantitative factors, you can access a number of other sources. For one, Crystal publishes data related to its debt-based indices every month. In fact, here's a screenshot from the first March 2021 fact sheet, which shows the average YTM, average maturity, average Macaulay duration, and the average modified duration for the most important debt-based indices. Another source to know about these indicators are the monthly fact sheets that are published by the mutual fund companies and are available on their website. And of course, you can access these and even more information on the ET Money app and website, which features thousands of different schemes in a simple and comparison friendly format. The portfolio of a debt mutual fund is available in the fact sheet and offers six different types of information. These include the types of instruments in which the scheme has invested, the bond issuers, the coupons offered, the maturities of the paper, the risk profile depending on the credit rating of the issuers, and finally, the weightage of each instrument in the portfolio. The type of bond issuer and the credit rating is an important determinant in fund selection and something the investor should look out for. To put it simply, schemes which invest in government securities or papers with high credit rating or both come with a low issuer default risk, which is more suitable for risk averse investors. Another area to look out for is the concentration risk in debt mutual funds. A concentration risk arises when a scheme holds a disproportionately high part of the AUM with a single issuer. This in turn exposes the portfolio to a higher amount of risk if this issuer might default or if their bond prices might drop for whatever reasons. Having said this, a good practice that a debt fund investor can employ is to avoid having too many debt funds from the same mutual fund company. 
The reason for suggesting this is based on the observation that different debt schemes of the same AMC tend to invest in similar papers which can create unnecessary concentration risk in your portfolio. By spreading across different AMCs, you have a better chance of lowering the concentration risk. risk meters have been featured in fact sheets since 2015, but it's only starting January of this year that risk meters really started becoming a useful tool in investing decisions. Because starting this year, the SEBI directed all mutual fund companies to move to a new six-level risk meter, which aims to make risk scoring a more scientific pursuit. Specific to debt funds, a scheme's risk is now calculated as an average of three risk categories, the credit risk, the interest rate risk and the liquidity risk. And from the looks of it, the new riskometer can actually act as the first alert signal to all debt fund investors. And here are the reasons why. Firstly, the new riskometer is a standardized tool and is an easy to understand way of assessing risk levels for the everyday investor. Two, the schemes within the same category can have different risks so depending on their credit, interest rate and liquidity risk. This allows for meaningful comparisons between schemes within the same category. And finally, all fund houses need to update their scheme risk score every month and communicate any change of risk to the unit holders in a templatized format. This regular monitoring will allow investors to be alert to rising risk levels, which can definitely assist in better decision making. For too long, most investors, including me, have been taking their debt fund decisions on recognizable factors such as the one-year performance, the 3 year CAGR, exit load, expense ratio, AUM size, and to some extent the portfolio mix of the scheme. We certainly hope this video has been an eye-opener for you and you would want to use this opportunity to relook at your debt portfolio with more emphasis on the yield to maturity, average duration, modified duration, concentration risk, and the changes in the riskometer. Do let us know which part of the video you particularly liked and would want to implement pronto in the comments box below. I hope you liked our content and will draw many learnings from the information and insights presented. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share this video with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for watching and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.